Okay, so for a lot of what we're going to need to do in biochemistry, we need to review some basic, simple chemistry and the idea that matter is anything that has space and takes up matter. And then the concept of atoms and elements, with the atom building being the building block of all matter and an element being a specific type of atom that cannot be broken down any further at all. And if we remember elementary school chemistry or way back in grade 9, remember that an element's properties depend on the structure of its atoms. And then atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, electrons. And the protons and neutrons sit in the nucleus, packed in there, held together by nuclear forces. And the electrons orbit around the nucleus. Typically, we talk about them orbiting around in rings or shells. However, in reality, you'll learn in chemistry that they occur in clouds, and these clouds have some pretty weird shapes. But for most of our purposes, for what we need to do in biology, the electrons travel in rings. It, it's easy, and for what we need to do and where we need to go with it, it works. And always remember that the electrons have a negative charge. They're found outside the nucleus. Usually, they're in a... 2, 8, 8, 8 arrangement. If you remember those old Bohr Rutherford diagrams, the protons are sitting in the nucleus along with the neutrons. The protons are going to be positively charged, and the electrons are going, sorry, and the neutrons are going to be neutral with the electrons being negative. Now, if you remember how we draw atoms and elements, remember that the the nucleus sits in the middle. It's got the protons and neutrons. We typically put a circle or a ball there. We write in how many P's for protons, how many N's for neutrons, and then we fill our shells. That works for a lot of things to show atomic structure, but what we need most of the time is to look at the group or the column the element's in. It will tell us the number of electrons in the last shell of those elements. And that last shell we often call the valence or outer shell. And it's the one that typically is involved in reacting when elements form compounds and bonds with other elements. And if we look at the periodic table with all those elements, really for biologists and in biology, we're really only concerned with a few elements. 96% of all living matter is made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. CHONE. The other acronym you can use for this is CHOMPS with phosphorus and sulfur. Phosphorus and sulfur are going to be found in different compounds. Phosphorus typically mostly in nucleic acids. Sulfur in proteins. Nitrogen will be found in amino acids. And the other three are the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, really the backbone of all organic chemistry. The other elements here shown in green are also important for different things inside organisms such as Magnesium is extremely important for plants when it comes to photosynthesis and chlorophyll. Iron, of course, in animals for hemoglobin in the red blood cells. Calcium, important for bones, and if you lay calcium down in bones and in teeth, it's, it becomes a mineral. It's laid down on a protein matrix and it becomes a, a compound called hydroxyapatite that forms all our sorts of bones and teeth, and it's just a matter of how you lay it down on that skeleton that gives it its strength. Now when we look at the periodic table, we're often given a lot of numbers, but really back in simple chemistry, we're really concerned most of the time with two numbers. The atomic number, which is sort of the big number, like the jersey number of the element. Each one has a unique atomic number. And the atomic mass, how much ideally one atom of that element would weigh if we could put it on a scale. And of course, using those two numbers, we could find out the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The other measurement that we may not have introduced to you yet is the concept of electronegativity and sometimes it just gets represented as uh, E with a, a lowercase n subscript beside it and that's an element strength if you can imagine elements um, holding on to these electrons trying to keep them close to the nu nucleus that force is called electronegativity and some elements are very strong some tend to be very weak in general as you go across the periodic table, the elements tend to get stronger as you go from the left 
to the right. So the halogens in group 7 tend to have extremely high electronegativities in general, and the metals all tend to have very low electronegativities, which is one of the reasons metals always tend to lose electrons. Okay, now in terms of how many particles, I know you know this, but we do have to go over it. The atomic number will tell you the number of protons, and all things being equal, if it's a normal uncharged atom, it's also going to tell you the number of electrons. If you wanted to find the number of neutrons, of course, it's kind of like a train where you know 16 of the passengers are males and you've got a total carload of passengers of 50. You just do the subtraction, atomic mass minus atomic number. Now with some of the elements, you're going to get decimals and it's not possible to have a part of a proton. So what we do is we round off. And the reason we round off is this concept called isotopes that you've been introduced with before. Many of these isotopes are radioactive because with all these extra heavy neutrons they tend to be unstable and they will lose particles, in some cases neutrons, but also protons off the nucleus and that will make them change to other elements. And when they're radioactive we can use them for dating things, we use them as markers in medical tests and these isotopes, besides be being the name of the baseball team and the TV cartoon The Simpsons, they're also extremely useful in medicine and for dating compounds and in lots of different things you might see them in a medical field. Now when you bond some of these atoms together you get a compound. A compound is something that has two or more elements in it and the molecule we're looking at here is a water molecule but it's a molecule of the compound known as water and the subscript 2 didn't come through but that's okay so there's an important distinction there it's not something you always want to mix up okay. another example is carbon dioxide it's just a different way of showing the elements with carbon in the middle with its four electrons and then sharing some of those electrons with um, oxygen atoms and you can see the other four of the valence shells there with carbon and the two in the inside shell. Okay. Now elements bond together typically because we talk about them wanting to have full valence shells and that goes to the octet rule, the rule of eight. That if you have a certain number of valence shell electrons, if you have seven for example, you want to gain one to get to eight. If you're something like sodium and you only have one valence shell electron, you'll tend to lose that one to have a full valence shell below it. So this leads us to the concept of ions and these sorts of things because elements will bond together because they want to try and fill or empty those valence shells. And even though the Lewis diagrams and the, the 288 concept of the Bohr-Rutherford shells doesn't work for a lot of elements in chemistry and a lot of purposes. It's not truly correct. The simple old Lewis diagrams of the first 20 elements really work because in, in biology we're really mostly worried with just sort of, with just chomps, chomps, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and that's going to cover over 96% of what we're going to have to worry about when we talk about biochemistry. And again, when these atoms bond or fill their valence shells, they're going to gain or lose electrons. And if something's gaining an electron, something's going to lose it. Electrons just don't simply fly around through space typically for very long. They're very valuable things. And in fact, we'll see when a metabolism when we get to that section that electrons really are going to end up representing energy inside a cell. So someone's gain is always another's loss. Another's loss. Okay, so ions form when something gains or loses electrons based on that octet rule. If you lose electrons, you become a positive ion or a cation, and most of the time those are metals. If you gain electrons because you have a high electronegativity, you've become negative and you are an anion. Again, you can sort of remember this different ways. You know, cats are good and ants are bad. There's lots of different ways to remember this. But if we've got any two elements, we would look up their electronegativities on the periodic table. We'd find it, for example, for sodium here. And for chlorine, we'd look up their electronegativities, and you can do that at home and see that the difference between them is great. And that means that if you think of it as an arm wrestling contest that 
chlorine will actually rip an electron away from sodium. And chlorine will gain that electron, sodium will lose it, and the attraction between them will keep them together. And we measure that by talking about the difference in electronegativity, this concept right here. And if that is greater than or equal to 1.7 when you subtract the electronegativities between those two elements, then you know it's going to be an ionic bond because an electron is transferred or moved from one atom to another. It's not shared, it's actually transferred from one atom to the next. And that means that some of these are positive and some are negative. And as we know, opposites attract. Paul Abdul made a career out of that song, Opposites Attract. So we talk about this just simply most of the time being Paula Abdul chemistry. Now the other possibility that can happen with these electronegativities is that one atom isn't strong enough to rip it away from the other. When that happens, we've got sharing of electrons happening. And usually we talk about pairs of electrons. That's the most correct way to talk about it. But sharing is a lot stronger than an ionic bond. And these shared bonds of shared electrons are called covalent bond because the electron spends some time in both valence shells of the electron. So this electron here from the carbon atom will spend some time in oxygen's valence as well as its own home valence in carbon. So since it's in both, it's covalent, spending time in both. And we have measurements for this because just like when you borrow something from a friend or you're supposed to share it, the sharing can be equal or unequal. If the sharing's pretty equal, if it's less than about 0.5, we talk about that sharing being a nonpolar situation. And what's that, what that means is the electron spends an equal amount of time around each atom. If the electron spends a little more time around one atom than another, if it's above 0.5 but less than 1.7, so it's not ionic, so if it's in between ionic and nonpolar, we talk about it being a polar covalent bond because that means the electron spends more time around one atom than the next. So if we were to look at something like the bond between oxygen and hydrogen, oxygen has a higher electronegativity so the electrons will spend more time around it and what will end up happening is oxygen will be slightly negative and the hydrogen atom would be slightly positive because it's lost its electron most of the time and since the electrons spend a lot of time around one atom, we talk about them it being polarized. So that's the term, a polar covalent bond. So just to sum up, covalent bonds, sharing of electrons, ionic bonds, transfer of electrons. Covalent bonds are very, very strong. They tend to be hard to break. Ionic bonds, easily broken. And one of the things that's going to happen when you throw an ionic bond or an ionic compound into water is essentially it's just going to fall apart. And the term we use for that isn't really dissolve we use the term dissociate. Uh, salt will dissolve into water into smaller molecules, but really, technically on a molecular level, most of the time, salt just simply falls apart into its component ions of a positive sodium ion and a negative chlorine ion, and they'll float around in the water. And that's actually the basis of how salt water chlorinators work. They split the salt, that's the salt molecules that are dissolved in the water, and force the chlorine molecules to come together with some other chemicals to form cl the chlorine that you would normally dump in a swimming pool. So that's the basis of the chemistry we need to start out with and starting to talk about chemical bonds, and that'll lead us to some other things later on.